Over the years of creating Fact Hunt, of all the stories I've covered, there's one publisher that's remained consistent with their endless corruption and overall douchebaggery. Electronic Arts. I've no idea what it is about EA, but their customer base seems to be more a hindrance to them more than anything. Annoying plebs complaining in their pursuit to hand them their money. And this abhorrent attitude of theirs has been going on for longer than you could possibly imagine. So this episode, we take a look back at these Hawking's horror stories, these origin ostracizations, and these battlefield bullies as well as if there's been any updates since, as I say. But hello you, I'm Guru Larry and I welcome you to a Fact Hunt special. Five tales of EA being complete and utter scumbags. EA Seminole, why does some sod always get the tank before me simulator, Battlefield 3, was pretty much a soft reboot of the franchise. And while it was technically closer to the Bad Company's spin-off series than the original, it did spark a new light into then ailing franchise. However, that didn't stop EA from talking out their bum holes when trying to lure PS3 owners into pre-ordering. Seeing Battlefield 3's massive potential, Sony struck a deal with EA to entice gamers to buy the game for their system, with their main draw being anyone who pre-ordered the PlayStation version would also receive a copy of Battlefield 1943 on the Disc 2, an online-only, heavily consoleized sequel to original World War II Battlefields, which was actually a pretty decent offer as 1943 was a great game. Only thing was, come launch day, it was totally missing from the disc. Where was our free game you promised? Gamers shouted angrily at the house of Hawkins. So in age old fashion, they took to Twitter and Reddit to complain to EA about this atrocity en masse. So, did EA make good on their initial promise and sent everyone a download code for the missing game? <laughs> You're having a laugh, ain't you? No, their compromise was out of the goodness of their own hearts that would allow you to buy the DLC for the game a whopping seven days early. Which is something you could actually do already. Of course, this most generous offer wasn't good enough for those selfish, entitled gamers who ended up filing a class action lawsuit against EA for misleading consumers. This ultimately resulted in not EA finally giving codes to those affected, as you might think but just making the entire game free on PSN, so anyone could now nab it, whether they had bought Battlefield 3 or not. Still, a slap in the face for people who actually did pre-order the game, but it did teach EA a valuable lesson and they never did anything shitty ever again. For about three days. Of course, we can't have a fact hunt on dodgy stuff going on without EA rearing their ugly heads at least once. But aside from scamming people with loot boxes and constantly biting the hand that feeds them, the House of Hawkins are also known for being the publisher to turn the lights out on a console generation, often being the company to release the final game on various systems. Now, releasing games on a dying platform may sound like a stupid business move, but it's actually highly profitable. For example, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas was released on the PS2's autumn years, yet was by far the biggest selling title of all time for it, amassing an incredible 30 million copies. So it may be an older system, but it always has a far larger user base than the next generation system, and with consoles dropping in price, even going for pennies on the second hand market, people and families of lower incomes swamp to this far cheaper library. And this is where EA come in. Wanting to sell a slightly cheaper new release to this demographic, 
but at the same time not wanting to fork out development costs for a whole new game, decided to come up with their legacy series of titles, which are literally the exact same game from the previous year, just with an updated roster. This started during the PS2's generation with FIFA 14, which, you know, is sort of acceptable, but now the PS3 and Xbox 360 are also receiving legacy editions. Consoles which could easily accommodate this as an inexpensive DLC pack. Releasing games only a five or less than the next generation fully redeveloped versions is taking a mickey a bit. And if this wasn't bad enough, EA aren't even waiting for a console to dwindle now. FIFA 20 on the Nintendo Switch has already resorted to a legacy edition, despite only two previous releases on the system. So, yeah, it's a little bit scummy of Electronic Arts to essentially double dip on older games, charging slightly less than full retail on updates they could easily release for pennies as DLC. Thanks, EA. Whoa, hold on there, Pass Larry. Since making this video, EA has released another FIFA Legacy Edition on Switch. And another! So Electronic Arts have released the same game four times now. I mean, come on guys, there must be an audience if you keep selling them. It's super scummy you've not considered making a new FIFA after nearly half a decade now. <laughs> And it's not just long-established IPs EA could completely ruin either. One of their most painful examples has to be with Pandemic's fantastic 2009 open-world game, The Saboteur. It's a pretty decent sandbox title, where you play as an Irishman voiced by someone who's never heard an Irishman before. Oh, he's not a motherless arse-faced knob jockey. In occupied France during World War II. Now, as great as the Saboteur was, it was an EA game after all, so they had to completely ruin it for everyone somehow. And that's exactly what they did, making it part of their infamous Project $10 initiative. Now, this rather despicable tactic is something I'll be dedicating a future Fact Hunt special to. But those of you who have not heard of it before, Project $10 was Electronic Arts' ultra-scummy attempt to dissuade the appeal of buying used games, which EA openly claimed as being worse than piracy. So to tackle this heresy of people wanting to buy games out of print or a bit cheaper, they would only allow you to play the multiplayer component of a game by entering the included game code. Anyone who bought the game used and wanted to play it online would be subjected to a, well, fine of $10 to access that part of the game. Yeah, and you thought their loot crates were bad. Anyhow, the problem with the Saboteur was it was single player only. It had no multiplayer mode to hold to ransom. So, what did EA do to entice you into pre-ordering the game? and more so buying a brand new copy? Oh, tits! The Saboteur contains several brothels and speakeasies in the game, and EA thought the best way to find those skin flint gamers buying used copies was to cover up all the girls in them. Now, this financial censorship had absolutely zero effect on the gameplay itself whatsoever. But if you wanted to see all the digital ladies exposing their bristles in the game, you were going to have to cough up 10 bucks for the privilege. That's a three month subscription on some adult sites. Um, not that I know anything about that. So before EA's vice was misleading children into gambling with surprise mechanics, they were pimping out their female NPCs. I don't think we'll ever see what depths EA are prepared to go to. Well, aside from the fact in true EA fashion they closed down the Saboteur servers less than two years after launch, so no one could see boobies anymore, whether they had bought the game new or not. So there's that.
So you practice the hell out of a game, learn the mechanics, master the gameplay and become skillful with the title. EA see how well you're doing and how do they reward you? With a permaban of course, because this is EA and EA are the worst. In October 2016, EA DICE released Battlefield 1 for all major platforms of the time, which was everything apart from the Nintendo Wii U. Anyway, by early 2017, reports started to appear online that some players were being banned from the game, even though they weren't cheating. Players who were doing really well in matches were complaining that after doing particularly well in a game, would soon be greeted by this screen informing them that they had been disconnected from the server and had received a suspension. But how could this happen? EA had applied an anti-cheat system to Battlefield 1 called Fair Fight that used an algorithm-based analyst to pick up on cheaters and avoid people who were playing fairly. Surely it wasn't just banning people who were scoring higher kill rates than the average player. Well, yes actually. That's exactly what EA's anti-cheat system was doing. The real top tier players were being penalised for being too good at the game by anti-cheat AI. One player by the name of KL Spasmo was one such victim as he was walking away from matches with kill to death ratios of like 127 to 2. Luckily for KL Spasmo, he was also recording his matches to upload to his YouTube channel, presumably to show off but he was able to show that he wasn't using any cheats and that he was just incredibly good at the game. Well, he was good at getting his mate to fly a plane while he sat in the gunner's seat and just shot everyone on the ground anyway. But it must have been quite frustrating for KL Spasmo, who showed on his YouTube videos that he was suspended quite a few times for playing too well. More so if he bought the Ultimate Edition of Battlefield 1, which would have set him back $129 at the time. Oof. Hi folks, welcome to John Madden Football. Get ready for some real hard-hitting action. We'll end this episode with a story I'm surprised has fallen out of memory. Especially with the publisher's constant track record of treating their audience like utter dirt. In the days before scamming their consumer base with loot box, I mean, surprise mechanics, Electronic Arts thought it would be far more profitable to just release unfinished games instead. And one needs to look no further than this than their second biggest sports franchise, Madden NFL, and its 2006 incarnation for the PSP. Now, playing Madden 06 in exhibition mode is perfectly fine. But dare you have the audacity to play the franchise mode, and every time you turn the ball over, for instance, throw an interception, the game would crash so hard, it would literally switch off the PSP, essentially soft bricking the handheld and losing all your progress. Now, for something that is reasonably common within an American football game, you'd have thought EA would have picked up on this during playtesting. But only after mass protests on the Madden forums did the House of Hawkins finally acknowledge and respond to this massive issue. So, what did EA do? They obviously offered a heartfelt apology, immediately released a patch, fixing the issue, and recalled all copies of this literally broken game, right? <laughs> no, of course not. This is EA we're talking about here. No, they put out a press release telling people to deal with it. Yep, EA decided that this game killing bug didn't receive enough complaints to warrant wasting their time on fixing, as anyone who was affected could go screw themselves. It was their problem now, not EA's. Players did finally discover a rather exhaustive workaround to this crashing issue, which was to quit out of the game and create a brand new save every single quarter to minimise any potential loss. But it's insane why anyone would want to continue using a completely broken product at full price, sold by a publisher who demanded players sort out the issue themselves. Wow! EA Sports. It's only a game. Why do you have to be mad? Hello, you. Thanks ever so much for watching. 
be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified, and be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon. But thanks again for watching, and until next time friends, I'm missing you already.